Hey everyone, Ronnie here from IKN. So in this video here, we're going to talk through an exercise or one of many exercises that we can utilize to expand lumbar flexion range of motion. Okay, so we're going to talk about lumbar spine behavior and why it's important to consider how the thoracic spine and the rib cage interact with the pelvis in order to afford the lumbar spine the capacity to flex. Okay. If you have watched some of the other videos on our YouTube channel, if you check out our channel, we have spoken about the importance of having clarity in your intention when you're utilizing interventions and how you can separate a interventions aimed at trying to expand range of motion versus interventions aimed at trying to build or develop muscular capacities where you're trying to develop greater force production or generation through a muscular tissue okay it's important to have that distinction because when we're trying to expand range of motion this will influence the entry point that we utilize in order to expand that range of motion particularly when we're trying to expand range of motion when an individual has a, a lack of tolerance or increased sensitivity or pain associated with that range of motion or if you have a client who has been avoiding that range of motion for a prolonged period of time that's going to influence then how you may regress or progress that exercise intervention or that movement intervention when you're trying to expand range of motion versus if you're trying to develop muscular capacities how you may progress and regress things would be very very different because that's a very different intention okay so we're going to talk about two key biomechanical features here and those are kinematics and kinetics okay in our opinion these help give us more clarity um, in what we're trying to look for when we're trying to expand range of motion from a muscular and joint segmental standpoint okay because kinematics represents the the behavior or the position or the motion of objects okay when we're talking about the human movement system we're concerned about muscles we're concerned about joints segments that make up those joints so we're concerned about the position of muscles the position of joints the motion of joints and the motion of segments but from a kinematic standpoint you're concerned about those without considering the forces that produce those motions or that allow you to assume those positions okay Whereas from a kinetic standpoint, that's when we are considering the position of muscles, the motion of muscles, the position and the motion of joints, while also considering the, uh, the forces that help to create those motions and help you assume those positions. Okay, So a couple of key kinematic and kinetic features within the context of this exercise, this is not a, a comprehensive list. These are just a couple of things that you can consider if your goal is to try and promote uh, lumbar flexion range of motion one is spinal retraction okay so in this position here i'm gonna jump in and out of this video because i think it's um it'll be helpful to um to give you a bit more clarity in what you're looking at so first and foremost we are in a seated position here because a seated position allows us to reduce the coordinated demand or the control demand on the pelvis and the trunk. Okay. Whereas if that pelvis was in space, there would be a lot more demand on the low limb and there would be a lot more coordinated demand or challenge on controlling the spine. Okay. And that will that would be a competing factor with us trying to promote that range of motion if we're trying to promote range of motion locally at the lumbar spine then i don't also want to be trying to coordinate muscle activity and and control across other segments okay what we're also going to consider here is that we want that that hip to be in a flex position mainly via the femur because if we're trying to promote lumbar flexion range of motion one thing that can help us in the early phases of that process so we have to consider that there are lots of ways that we can challenge your ability to express lumbar flexion, range of motion, and any range of motion for that matter. One of the things that we want to see is the ability of the pelvis to posteriorly rotate. When that pelvis posteriorly rotates, okay, or rotates backwards, and when that thoracic spine 
and rib cage, the thorax rotates forward. That will afford the lumbar spine the ability to flex. Okay. But consider for a moment that you're working with a client that hasn't accessed that lumbar flexion range of motion for a longer period of time. What can you do? Well, you can utilize the segments that connect to the pelvis, that connect to the, uh, the rib cage in order to promote those directional motions, okay? One is the femur here. So consider if I'm trying to promote the pelvis's ability to posteriorly rotate, and I'm working with a client that is struggling to do that, then I can bring the hip into flexion via the femur. Because if you watch what happens when that femur um, lifts up or when the hip flexes via the femur, think of that femur as a spoke on a bicycle wheel. And watch, that, watch, watch what direction it moves in. So it moves in a posterior direction. If you were to imagine that there was a, a wheel, uh, that, that femur was a spoke connected to a wheel, that would rotate backwards. And what does the pelvis have to do? It has to rotate backwards. So that can help assist the ability of the pelvis to rotate, to afford the lumbar spine the ability to flex. Okay. And what we're also going to do here in this position is we're going to couple that with flexion of the thoracic spine, but also a retraction of the spine. So a retraction is a, is a movement of a segment backwards in space, but it's more of a linear motion. That motion that I've just described there via the femur is more of an angular or rotational motion because it occurs on a circular or curved path. Okay, this is another, a, a more of a deeper kinematic representation. We can explore these, these concepts on upcoming videos as well. We, we do a lot more of this on our courses, um, our level one, level two courses, and on our inner circle membership, if you want to learn more about that. But what that spinal retraction does, where the spine is retracting in space, a protraction of the spine will be the spine reaching forward. We all know about cervical and head retraction, cervical and head protraction where things are reaching forward, reaching backwards. But that spinal retraction helps to further assist the capacity of that spine to flex as a whole. But because we have the femur flexed, the hip flex via the femur, and because we're also going to consider how we can drive some load via posterior pelvic rotation to get some load into the abdominals, and how we're going to drive some load via femoral hip extension via the femur, we're going to be able to concentrate a lot of that motion um, at the lumbar spine as well, even though we're getting assistance from above and below. Okay, like I said, there's lots of ways that we can further challenge this um, in, in clients. Okay, because we want to consider this as an entry point to expanding that range of motion in clients that may have been avoiding that for a long period of time or in clients that may have been um, experiencing pain with that motion. Okay, so key things there is spinal retraction where we have a linear motion backward coupled with a forward rotation of the, um, the spinal column. So you consider here that the flexion of the spine is a forward rotation. Consider the spinal column also as a spoke in a bicycle wheel. When we see flexion, that is a forward rotation of the spinal column, whereas an extension of the spine would represent a backward rotation of the spinal column. Okay, so these are more segmental-based representations versus a joint based representation. It doesn't mean that this is how we should be describing things. This just gives us the ability to have a clearer description on the directional motions of segments. And it's something that uh, joint uh, based um, descriptions don't really allow us to do. It doesn't mean that joint descriptions aren't enough. It just mean, or it doesn't mean that they're not good. It does just mean that they're not enough to give us those segmental directional um, uh, representations if you like okay and then we have that posterior pelvic rotation assisted via hip flexion but via the femur so remember you can flex the hip but you, you can flex the hip via the pelvis rotating forward on top of the um the femur or you can flex the hip via the femur moving relative to the the pelvis okay so that's why we have to describe the segment that is um contributing more so to that joint range of motion and then we get into kinetics. So how are we going to contract muscles here? Again, we all know about um, PNF strategies, or the contract relax strategies here, and we can incorporate a lot of those, um, those contractile dominant strategies to 
gradually allow an individual to expand range of motion. Because what has to happen for a segment or a joint to move in a certain direction? The muscles need to change their length as well. They need to change their behavior. So we do need to consider what the muscular tissues have to do to afford the segments the ability to move into a certain direction. Okay. So we're going to talk about a hip extensor contraction here via the femur. That's why you, why you see the, the hands kind of um, the fingers interlaced here to provide a fixed um, block for us to drive that knee forward into the hands, um, which would get some load into the into the glutes, into the hip extensors. But we're also going to couple that with a lumbar flexor contraction via the abdominals, okay, and via a posterior pelvic rotation. Okay. So Let's talk about what that looks like here. So you can see here that I have the foot um, on a, a chair in front. I'm retracting the, so at the very beginning there, we'll kind of, we'll come back to this where we go through more of a dynamic um, motion here. But what we're gonna see here is we're gonna see that retraction. We're interlacing the hands around the front of the shin. We're allowing the scapulae to protract. We can allow the head to, ro to rotate forward to assist that thoracic spine flexion. But what we're also doing here is we're actively posterior, posteriorly rotating the pelvis to get some load into the lower abdominals. Again, that's a it's a pelvic dominant contraction. Um, so that's why we could theoretically consider that the lower abdominals are experiencing most of that of that force of that load. And then once we get into this position, what we want to be able to do here is as I'm demonstrating there is. We're retracting back, we're getting to that position. We're contracting the lower abdominals, but now we're driving the knee into the hands. That reaching of the knee into the hands is going to assist or facilitate a contraction of the glutes. The glutes will have to contract to facilitate a posterior pelvic um, rotation. Okay. Now, what's missing here? What's missing here is the dosage. Okay. If you're working with a client experiencing pain with this, Again, it is important to consider how all the segments are interacting with each other, as we've just discussed. But we also want to be more mindful of how we're dosing the application of physical load or the, the contraction intensity there as well and all the other quantitative variables, the load, the duration, frequency, and so on. So from a contraction intensity standpoint, we can keep that contraction intensity quite low at around 20 to 30% or 2 out of 10 relative to the client's maximum voluntary contraction. I know that can be an arbitrary number for a lot of clients that haven't experienced what 100% of their maximal voluntary contraction is. But then we can, if we're trying to expand the range of motion, we can hold that two to three out of 10 contraction initially. We can increase that as long as the client is tolerating that motion. We can hold for 10 to 15 seconds, with that posterior pelvic rotation, that reaching forward. Again, you're just seeing me kind of drop into greater hip flexion here as we drive that knee forward. I'm just gonna pause it there for a second. So hold that contraction for 10 to 15 seconds. After 10 to 15 seconds, we can reach that spine back even further via retraction. We can try and posterior tilt back even further to open up that lumbar spine even further. And then we can contract via the knee reach even further or even more so in that position okay or for another 10 to 15 seconds we can repeat that for two to three sets so we're accumulating around 30 to 45 seconds of time under tension or for a duration of contraction okay and then if we wanted to build greater capacities in that range of motion then we can gradually increase that contraction intensity or hold for longer durations as well but if we're trying to gradually expand that range of motion in an individual that's been avoiding it for a longer period of time, or that is maybe having sensitivity when moving into that direction. We want to keep the contraction intensity low, and we can maybe use duration as a training effect initially before we increase that contraction intensity. Okay. But the, the key thing here as well is, is being able to concentrate some of that load into the glutes, because oftentimes when we're trying to get load into the glutes via hip extension, we are often also um, coordinating that with the quads because the foot's in contact with the ground, with the ground um, typically, and you're driving load via the foot to get load to the glutes, but you're also getting load through other muscular tissues as well. By having the foot in contact with a chair in front, we take the shin, we take the foot, we take the quads 
out of the equation. And by reaching that knee forward, the, the arms are staying fixed in space. By reaching that knee forward, it does provide a, a fixed surface for us to be able to retract the spine backwards against. But by driving the knee forward into the hands, it allows us to just concentrate that motion via the femoral segment, meaning that we're concentrating that muscular contraction via the muscles that only move the femur. Okay, and in this situation, it will be the the glutes. You're going to you're going to get some some proximal hamstring here as well. Okay. But the, the dosage is, is important to consider there too. Now, just to, to drop back to the, um, the beginning of the video here, um, where I discussed how we can kind of bring that into more of a, uh, a dynamic contraction as well, where we're dropping that pelvis back and then bringing it back through a anterior rotation from there. So that's when we have the range of motion available to us and we're simply just trying to work in and, out, in and out of that range of motion dynamically, okay? But that will be different if we're trying to expand that range of motion. This is just a video from one of our courses, uh, one of many videos that we can utilize to expand that range of motion. As a progression from this, you can consider how might you go about making this more challenging for the individual. Let's say you wanted to concentrate the motion at the pelvis via posterior pelvic rotation. You can reduce that need to retract the spine. You can reduce the, the movement excursion that the thoracic spine and rib cage moves through so that you're, you're not getting that assistance from above, but you're bringing the thoracic spine into, into less flexion movement excursion so that you're just concentrating that motion via the pelvis more. You can bring the femur into uh, less hip flexion or less flexion as well, but that would change what muscular tissues you are contracting um, with as well, okay? So a lot of things to consider here, but I do think that this, like I said initially, these are no nonsense descriptors of muscle and joint behavior. When we use biomechanics and we use these ideas of kinematics and kinetics versus using descriptors like promoting flexibility, promoting mobility. These are, are nice, easy terms to use when we're talking to a client. But for us rehab practitioners, when we're trying to promote movement in a direction where the client has a limitation, or when we're trying to consider how we might regress or progress an intervention, whether or not we're, or whether we're trying to expand range of motion or whether we're trying to develop muscular capacities, which, which are different intentions, we want to have more clarity in the mus muscular and joint behavior. And by me telling you, just do an exercise that gets the, that promotes mobility of the lumbar spine. That doesn't tell you anything. That doesn't tell you how the pelvis is moving. That doesn't tell you how the femur is contributing to that. That doesn't tell you how the thoracic spine is contributing to that. So that's why we have to describe things through a muscular and joint segmental lens when we're trying to um, apply physical stress and load to the movement system with specific intentions, okay? The intention here, of course, is to expand lumbar flexion, range of motion. And of course, it is one of many strategies we have available to us to expand that lumbar flexion range of motion. But it can be a very helpful one and an and easy entry point for a client to utilize um, when they're trying to promote that range of motion, okay? Especially if they've, if they've experienced limitation limitations or they've been avoiding that motion for a prolonged period of time and it gives us the opportunity to get assistance from other neighboring segments to make it less coordinatively demanding for the individual early on okay so it's a, it's a key feature of our courses that we work through um, and hopefully it makes sense like always with all our videos if you have any questions please let us know below